Go ahead and take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians most of the message. I want to read uh, several verses here. I'm going to kind of read it with uh, my commentary uh, on this passage as we go through it. I want to point out a few things to you before I get to what I'm uh, wanting to speak about this morning. But 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 1 it says, Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's a good verse everybody ought to have memorized. The main qualification that you need in order to be used of God is faithfulness. Faithfulness is important. I could preach 10 messages on faithfulness. That is very important. Faithfulness. Get that in your head. Verse 3. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Okay, well that be, We need to make sure we're very careful you know, in trying to figure out what's motivating people, all right? Because, you know, we can't see people's hearts, all right? We can't do it. We can only see the outward. And people, they're going to judge you. They're going to make judgments about you. But here's the thing, on judgment day, that's when we'll all know for sure, okay? And some of us, we just, we, you know, it's okay to, you know, we're all going to make judgments. We can't help but do that. But we got to be careful. and We should never uh, hold people accountable for what we are thinking. We don't know for sure what's in people's hearts, okay? But God will reveal it on judgment day. Then we will know. But right now, we're, we're not going to know for sure, so be careful about judging those things. Verse 6, And these things, brother, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that none of you be puffed up for one against another. Be careful about putting people on a pedestal. Be careful about looking up to men too much. You know, two things that I think are destroying Baptists today is you got people idolizing big shots, and then you've got people wanting to be the big shots. Okay? We need to be careful about that. You put somebody on a pedestal too high, all right, you're just going to be in for a letdown. You're going to be disappointed. Don't do it. Uh, you know, don't do it to me. You, all right, you might get me lifted up with pride, and then I'm just waiting for destruction after that. So watch that stuff. Verse 7, For who maketh thee to defer one from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? If you've got some special talent, if somebody does have an exceptional ability, do you all understand that it was God that gave that to him? So why would you brag on that? You know, why would you, why would you boast in your ability that was just something that you received of God? Why would we not just give God the glory for those things? That's what we should be doing. And so if you see someone out there who has exceptional ability, and there are people out there who have exceptional abilities, okay, don't go lifting that person up. You know what? Praise God for it. And if you don't have that ability, well, that's because God doesn't want you to do what they're doing. God's got something that's for you. And so, uh, you know, whatever you have going for you, you got it from God, so give him the glory for it. Verse 8, Now ye are full, now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle to the world and to angels and to men. Listen to what he says here. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat it. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, 
But as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Okay, I don't, and a lot of stuff that's in this passage here. But a few things I want to point out to you real quick before I get into the message is notice what Paul said. He said, we are fools for Christ's sake. Okay, and he's talking about himself and he's talking about himself, especially as an apostle. Okay, we've been appointed unto death. Pretty much all the apostles, according to history, they were all martyred. Paul was often beaten and thrown in prison. He suffered one thing after another. And he makes that statement. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake. He says, but you're wise in Christ. What was he saying when he's saying we're fools for Christ's sake? Well, any normal person, all right, any lost person would look at the apostle Paul and say, this guy is a fool. Here he is. He's preaching this stuff and he's getting beat up for it. He's getting thrown into prison. He's getting whipped. And not only that, you know, he'll get beat up for it. And then he'll get thrown in prison. He'll get out of prison. Then he goes and he does it again and he gets beat up again. Who does that? A fool does that according to the world. But you all understand that Paul, he didn't care about that stuff. He wanted to spread the gospel and he didn't mind looking like a fool to the world. But he tells them, he's like, I'm telling you all these things because I'm, I want to warn you. Okay. And Paul, he is, he's trying to prepare these people for what's to come and you know, here at Liberty Baptist Church, you know, we've taken some strong stand in some areas that aren't popular. And our, our world is changing fast, folks. I don't know if y'all realize that, you know, we've, we've got people acting like we're having revival in America because Trump banned transgenders from being in the military. All right. I mean, you know, that's to me, you know, I'm glad he did that, but I don't think that's a sign of victory right there. All right. That's a sign that you know, what in the world were they even doing in there in the first place? But I mean, you know, no great victory there, folks. All right. We are still in trouble. Uh, I wouldn't get too excited about that. But, you know, preachers, they're compromising left and right. I read an article this morning about that. It was, it was on the Fox News app. Some preacher was on there and he is talking about how he fears for America and how Jesus would be embarrassed by Christians today because Christians are celebrating this victory of transgenders not being allowed in the military. And what in the world are we doing being down on that when we have our own sins too? And basically, because we're all sinners, we're not allowed to have a problem with perversion, apparently. I mean, it was the biggest joke I ever read in my life. It just, it absolutely made me sick and disgusted. But listen, that, that's where we're at, compromising. Just, I mean, compromising and we're just kind of following the world. We're not as bad as the world, but we're still following them. We're getting farther from Christ. And, you know, preachers say they're compromising because they think if they're going to have any kind of influence in their communities, they've got to compromise. And I believe this strategy has failed miserably. I mean, just look at our country. Are we getting better? You know, look at our churches. Are we getting better? Folks, when, you know, transgender is not being allowed to be in the military anymore is perceived as a victory. I mean, that just shows how far gone we are. That, that that's even, you know, that that's even considered a victory. That's just common sense. But, you know, this compromise, it has, it's helped things get so bad in our country that an honest attempt to do things biblically in a church, to preach the Bible, you know, to have, you know, to be uncompromising, you're looked at like you're some crazy cult. Okay. That's just how it's going to look folks. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you that if you're members of this church, that you will always be seen as the most popular people in the community, the most respected people in the community. But you know what? I think you know, there, you, there's a good chance some of you might get accused of being a part of a cult. Okay? Now, you and I know this isn't a cult. All right? You and I know I haven't made you drink any Kool-Aid. You know, I mean, there's no uh, major requirements that you got to do to be here. You all know me. Y'all, I'm, y'all know I'm nice. I'm not crazy. But listen, those accusations, you know are coming and have come, all right? So just, you know, be, be prepared for some of that. I'm telling you this, like Paul, to warn you. And, you know, and I, listen, I have no interest. I, I'm not just trying to talk big right now, but listen, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I have no interest in compromising. I am 100% okay with looking like a fool. Folks, we have got a ton of churches in this area. There, there's, they're all over the place that are already doing everything you're supposed to do according to the world and religion. I, I 
I did not come to this town to just make one more of what there's already a ton of, okay? I mean, I, I want our church to be unique, all right? I'm not trying to be unique just to be unique, all right? But I believe, you know, preaching the Bible like you're supposed to, being uncompromising, it is very unique today. And I think our country needs that. I think our community needs that in a great way. And you know what? I am 100% ready to look like a fool. I'm, I'm fine with that. But this message today, it is, it's warning, just kind of like Paul did, because, you know, if you follow me, there's a good chance you might look like a fool too. And so my question is, are you willing to follow a fool? Are you willing to follow a fool? And so let's look at some things in the Bible to help us understand. Because here's, here's the thing that it's, I think we need to be able to do. And I, I, you know, and I hate to talk about myself, but I'm kind of forced to talk about myself a little bit. You know, I speak as a fool. That's what Paul would always say whenever he would talk about himself. But, you know, you know I, one of the things that helps me get along with people is I think I am usually pretty good at being able to see things from their perspective. Okay. And, it, and that helps me to be able to relate with people, to be able to talk with them, communicate with them. And what we need to do right now, I want us to take a look at us through the world's eyes. Because I, I do, I believe it will help us understand that. Because what happens today, people, they get accused of being in a cult, being weird, being whatever, and everybody panics. Everybody has a meltdown. You know, am I that? You know, you I mean, we're all fine. We feel sane. We're not. But then somebody tells us you're, we're crazy. And are, are we crazy? You know, we, we start wondering these things. But let's 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 we're going to take a look at things through their eyes. And I think we'll find out why they think the way they do. But at the same time, we're going to look at what the Bible says. And I'm going to show you that, you know what? We're not fools. Okay? We are not fools. We're right in what we do. And so, you know, let's look at some of these things in the Bible to help us understand why the world, why compromising churches see us the way they do. Because, you know, some people today, they are more concerned about what people think than what they know to be true. It's like, you know, people say, I know the Bible's true, but yet there's a certain things they don't want to preach from the Bible because, well, then everybody will think whatever. But if you know the Bible's true, then who cares what everybody thinks? You know, why, why do we let the thoughts people think control us so much? Okay? But people do all the time. And so, you know, here's some reasons I believe I will always look like a fool to the world. I, I'm going to look like a fool. One of the reasons I'm always going to look like a fool, I believe, is because I'm probably always going to be poor. All right. Look at look what he said in verse 11 of chapter four. He says, even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. One of the reasons the apostles were despised, they were, they don't even have a place to live. They don't have much money. You know, look at how he dresses, you know, and people look at that and they will despise you for it. And you know what? You know, I'm probably always going to be poor. One reason I have six kids, right? I, when you have a lot of kids, Okay, you're not going to have the money to do a lot of things that the world wants to do. All right? I don't have I, I don't have the big cable package that a lot of people have. I don't even have cable. All right? I can't afford those things. You know, I, I mean, I we don't eat at a lot of the fancy restaurants that people like to eat at because you try paying for eight people at some of these restaurants, it gets really expensive. All right, you know, most of our clothes that we get we get from Goodwill. All right. You know, I'm not trying to make anybody feel sorry for me today. Listen, I'm happy. Our needs are, are met and everything. But listen, nobody in the world is going to look at my life and say, man, I've got to have I've got to have his stuff. I mean, look at that van he's driving out there. I mean, you know, check out his truck. I mean, is that not, you know, nobody, nobody drools over those things. I'm not impressing anybody with that. OK, and so, um, you know. I'm, I'm not going to be a big attraction in this town because of those things. You know, six kids. You know, my wife wants to have another one after this medication's gone through her system, you know, that, uh, that she's been taking for the, for the hepatitis C and everything. And it's like, you know, I would be even more poor, you know? I mean, but at the same time, the Bible says, you know, children are our heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. The Bible says if you have a lot of children, you're blessed. The world sees that and they think you're nuts. Okay, but now let me ask you, 
you know me, who seems happier? You know, my family or these people out in the world with their 1.2 children and, and their cable packages and their nice cars and all those things. I think my family has more fun than most families do. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to brag, but I'm just saying I don't do what the world says to do to find happiness. I do what the Bible says, and the world looks at that as weird. You know, when we go places, when we're in the store or anywhere and people see our massive, you know, and I don't even think our family's that big. I don't think six kids is a huge family, but the world does. I mean, we have, we have literally, I mean, just seen people come to silence in conversations as we all come filing by, you know, dressed in our nice clothes and just as many of us as there are and everybody just watches and stares. And you know what? We get some, and sometimes we get disgusted looks. And it's like, uh, you know, the world despises that. But you know what? I refuse to be miserable with the rest of them. I'm glad I've got the big family. I, I don't regret it one bit. I recommend big families. And so um, that's, you know, but I'm going to look, it's, we're going to look like a fool to the world. Oh, you're those people with all those kids, right? You know, and people think that's nuts. You know, when you, uh, you know, when you have a lot of, when you have a big family too, you know, people look at, you know, they'll look at you with disgust. Like, you know, you're the ones that's causing all the global warming and us to consume all the resources and the overpopulation and, you know, destroying the rainforests and all that stuff. And it's just like, uh, you know, it's your stupidity that's doing all that stuff. But they do. I mean, the, the, the disgust. And, you know, we're always going to get that. And I'm, but I'm not going to change on that. All right. And so, you know, when you preach the way I do, you know, you're probably not going to be the biggest and richest church in town. Okay. We don't, you know, we don't have the fanciest building in town. We've got the crummy doors we're trying to save up and get rid of. You know, in some churches, man, they got the money in that church. They just go talk to one of the rich old ladies in the church and she writes out a check and boom, it's done just like that. But that rich old lady, she doesn't like hard preaching. So she's not going to come to the, she's not going to come to this church. You know, in our church, we're going to have things where the service is kind of dark because we got wires that start smoking, right? When church starts and you know, we've got to try to put that stuff out, you know, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll figure out how to fix that stuff. You know, it won't be done by a licensed electrician. It will be done by somebody in the church that knows what they're doing because we're going to try to save some money. But you know what? That doesn't impress some people. You know, if Mr. Moneybags would have showed up here today to visit and he sees that stuff going on and he smells the smoke and all that, you know, he's going to huff and puff and he's going to get out of here. You know, what, what's wrong with that church? Well, the Bible says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And you know what? To be a member of this church, you've got to be saved. And so, you know, that they're, they're just not here, folks. And they're probably not coming. All right? And I'd, I'd like to get them here. I'd like to get them saved. But we are not attracting those people. And I don't, I don't know that we ever will. But I'm not going to trim the message. There's plenty of churches already doing that. And those rich people are already in those churches. So I don't, I don't, I'm just, I'm not going to do it. Uh, look at what he said in verse 12. He said, you know, he's talking about the things he says, and labor, talking about himself, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer, we allow it. Paul, we see throughout his writings that he constantly had to work. Okay. Now listen, when I started, when I started this church, or decided I was going to start this church, I fully intended to do like my dad did. My dad just went and he started the church by himself. He worked a full-time job until the church was able to pay him. That's what he did. When I was, went to start the church here, I had all these preachers telling me, you need to go raise support. You need to go raise support. And I'm like, well, uh, fine, I'll do that, but I'm still planning on starting when I'm going to start. And I, ra I raised some support, and it was a blessing and everything. But honestly, um, you know, I don't really think that's the way to go about doing it. I, I don't really think that's necessary. In fact, all those preachers that told me I need to go raise support, none of them supported me financially when we started the church. That was kind of, that was kind of an interesting thing about that. All the people that did support me were people I never expected to. But they, you know, they did. And um, you know, I remember, though, it, it wasn't a lot. And so you know, real soon after starting the church, I had to get a job. And I'm just going to tell you all something. In the preacher world, if you work a job, you're kind of looked at as like second class, a second class preacher. You know, you're supposed to be full time. 
And they, you know, they expect you to have that church up and going in a year and be full time. And you know, it's just, it's not reality. But you know what? It really bothered me at first when I had to work. But then, because I'm thinking, man, you know, I must be compromising. I must not be trusting in the Lord. But then I'm reading the Bible and I'm seeing time and time again where Paul, you know, he was a tent maker. Paul, he worked, he labored, he, he did those things. But you know what? In, in the preaching community, you're not respected. If you do that and you know what, uh, you know, I, I do, I've got to work really hard. I would get more respect if I was full time. I sat around, was lazy, getting fat, playing golf all the time, hunting all the time or whatever. I would get more respect from the preacher community. If I did that, I spent all my time golfing, just going around being a big shot, then, you know, working hard like I do and trying to get a church going at the same time. It's just the way it is. You don't get respected. You are looked at as a fool, kind of like Paul. There he is. He's laboring. You know, big shots aren't supposed to be out there in the fields, you know, working as hard as they do. They're supposed to be the ones, you know, giving orders, being big shots. But listen, folks, you know, this is what I've got to do. I've got six mouths to feed. Well, eight counting my own and my wife's. You know, there's eight of us. That That's going to require a lot of labor. It's going to require a lot of work. And you don't get, res- you're not respected by the world from that. You're not expected by the religious establishments. But you know, uh, I personally think there are advantages to having a secular job. And listen, when this church is ready to pay me full time, I will quit my job in a heartbeat. All right? I, I promise that. I, I will quit that job so fast that you know the doors will fly off that building when I go running out of there. All right? I, I, I promise you that. But at the same time, I'm going to admit there are advantages. I, you know, I think I have far less stress as a pastor because I don't have to worry about offending everybody by my preaching. Because if, if I'm reliant, completely reliant on you all paying me, the offerings will then, I better not offend this person. If I offend them and they leave and their offering goes, well then, what am I going to do? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do right now. If you leave, I'll just work a few more hours out at Walmart. You know, you know they'll let me do that. You know, I, I can make up for it just like that. And so, you know what? I have a lot of liberty that I can preach whatever I want from the Bible. I can preach as hard as I want. And you know what? If you don't like that, if you want to take your money and go elsewhere, then you can do that. And you know what? I refuse to compromise the message. I enjoy preaching the truth. I, I, I do. I enjoy it. I want to do it. And so um, I'm not worried about it. I don't want to offend people. I don't try to offend people. I don't think, all right, what could I preach this week to just upset this person? Okay. I, I don't, I don't do that. But at the same time, you know, I, I can, if I see something in the Bible, Ooh, this is good. I can preach it and I don't have to worry about who's going to get upset by it. You know, I could transfer tomorrow with Walmart. There's distribution centers all over the country. In fact, there are distribution centers in parts of the country where that I have good friends that are pastoring churches. I could transfer to any of those places tomorrow and my family be taken care of and I could just help and serve in one of these churches and just, I don't know, to me, I think that would be a piece of cake. I could do that if I wanted to. I've got, I've got that ability, that freedom. And so you know what? That, tell, that frees me to just be able to preach whatever I want and not worry about it one bit. And so I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I'm fine. But however, you know, the, the world, others out there, they don't respect that. You know, they, they see as a fool. We've got these young guys they are graduating from Bible college and they won't even take jobs in churches unless they're like getting a full-time salary plus benefits. And I think that's ridiculous. And, you know, they're training these guys to basically just have a, you know, welfare mentality. Um, they, and they, a lot of these guys, they do get handed jobs right out of college and they're lazy. They're pathetic. They don't do hardly anything. And it ultimately results in them having some really bad character. And I think some of the best pastors I know are guys that are working jobs or had to work jobs because you know what? Those guys, if they were able to build a church while working a full-time job, it shows they've actually got some character. And so those guys I'm telling you, you know, even when they do get to go full time, they don't back off. They just work even harder and they accomplish even more. You know why? Because they have proven themselves to actually have some real character where these guys who mommy and daddy paid their way through Bible college, they don't have, you know, 
we don't know if they have character. Not they might, but a lot of them don't. A lot of them quit at the first problem that they have. Things slow down in the church. Sorry, we're going to have to cut your payback. What do they do? They quit. And then sometimes, too, these guys, they'll have to, you know, they'll cut their payback and maybe they've got to go get a part time job. And then they feel like the biggest losers in the world, like the biggest compromisers, because they are working a lowly, secular job when they are supposed to be a preacher. And you know what? And they see how they are despised. They see how they are looked at as a fool. And you know what they end up doing? Many times they end up quitting and giving up. But you know what? Um, I'm, I'm not going to worry about that. Okay? I said I, I will quit that job tomorrow if I can quit it tomorrow. But if I have to work it in the next five years, I'll work there the next five years. And so, um, you know, that's fine. And so anyway, look what it says in verse 13. In verse 13, it says, being defamed, we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. You know, my family, you know, me and my family right now, we're kind of what the world hates. All right. Husband and wife are on our first marriage, a bunch of kids. I'm the head of the household, you know, and people don't, people don't like that, you know, and my wife's a stay at home mom. She does a few piano lessons outside the home, but the, the world doesn't respect that. You know, she's supposed to go out and get a career. You know, she's got to go and, you know, make a name for herself and she's supposed to keep her name. You know, she should be Cassandra Cutler, you know, McMurtry, you know, you got to do all that stuff. But no, that, that's not, we don't, we don't do that stuff. All right. We're not into that feminism uh, stuff. We don't do, we don't do any of that. We are a traditional family. And the traditional family is despised today, okay? And all these stupid TV shows and things that people are watching, if you ever do have a traditional family where it actually is a husband and wife and children, the husband is always the idiot in the family. It, it just every time, every show. And the good families that have it all together, you know, it's the divorced homes or the single parent. They're the better parents. It's just the way it is. It's brainwashing. And the world, they don't like families like ours. You should see the looks that our family gets, especially when we come in contact with lesbians. I mean, I'm telling you, we were in the mall one day, and there were some that saw us, and they just sat there and scowled at us. We didn't do nothing. I didn't say nothing to them. I, you know, I didn't start preaching at them or anything like that. They just stared at us. When our kids, when they would take lessons, music lessons, for a long time, there was another set of them that uh, were there at the same time. And they would, they would just you know, sit there. And they had this little girl. She called one of them mom and the other one mommy or something. It was real confusing. And um, th they would just sit there and just scowl at us all the time. And we'd do it right back, you know. <laughs> I mean, just, but they, you know, they just, you know, the hatred that was there. And... Um, you know, it, it's, it's not popular. It's not going to be lifted up in the world. You know, the news media is not going to, uh, you know, they don't, they don't care about things like, you know, things, anytime you hear a positive story in the news media, it's always involving some group where there's some, either some kind of victim because of some kind of sickness or there's some kind of weird situation, you know, where, you know, if it's a husband and wife, well, it's because one used to be a girl and the other one used to be a man. You know, it, I saw a program one time. I was visiting somebody in the hospital and they had a program on there. It was all over the news. The first transgender couple where the guy used to be a girl and the girl used to be a guy. Surprise, surprise, broke up. And I'm sitting there watching this on the news in, in there. I'm, I'm wanting to throw up while I'm in there. I'm, I'm talking to these people in the waiting room and I'm just like, oh, Lord, can you please come back <laughs> now? <laughs> this world's this world's getting too bad. I mean, that is just it's just disgusting. You know, they're not going to do stories about you know they don't do stories about people who've been married for sixty or seventy years. You know, where do they find the first you know queer couple that's been married for you know has their twentieth anniversary or whatever? You know, if they live that long or stay married together that long, it'll be a huge deal. You know, even there, though there's people all over married 60 and 70 years sometimes, and that's not a big deal. But they, they do, they, they despise a traditional family. You know, they despise the big families. Once again, you know, we're the ones overpopulating the world and global warming, blah, 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 all that stuff. It's just ridiculous. But, it, you know, we're, we're not what the world's looking for. 
right now. We are not what's being featured. And so, and what I'm preaching and what I'm going to continue to preach about salvation is also despised. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look what it says in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, in verse 17. For it says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, those who are lost, foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto us which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Our gospel message that we preach here will always be, and will, conti and will continue to be, despised by the world. Why is it? Because it's one that's without works. We believe that anybody can get, you know, we believe anybody can get saved. We believe the Lord will save us just by trusting in his word, just by believing in him. We believe we'll be saved. We don't require people to change their act to, to be saved and get into church and get baptized and become a member of our church and go through all of our sacraments and procedures and things. And yet we're the ones that get called a cult. You know, we could have them do seven sacraments. And people don't call that a cult. You know, we can require that they do all these things and dress a certain way and act a certain way. And the world, you know, they won't call that a cult. But if we'll tell people, hey, you just put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Without works, we're the cult. Why is that? You know why? Because this message that we preach is extremely simple. And those who who are considered wise to the world will look at this and say, you know, that's a bunch of foolishness. And those who are even wise in, or considered wise in the Christian world will look at this message that we preach here and they will say foolishness. That is, that is not right. Y'all are a bunch of fools. And you know, we, yeah, we're going to look like fools. I get it. Okay. Let's look through their eyes. You've got the church where everybody's dressed nice. Everybody's, you know, everybody can tell us well to do. Have you ever been seen those churches too, where you look out in the parking lot and everybody's got the nice cars? It's like, man, why don't I pastor that church? I'll bet I could, you know, get paid real good there. You know, I mean, you, you know, you see all that stuff. I mean, these people, they've got their act together. I, there's one church here in town. You've got to, get, uh, you're like required to give like $5,000 a year to be a member of that church. And, you know, it's kind of their way of keeping the riffraff out of the church. But listen, you look at those groups, they look good. They're good people. You know, they're the prominent businessmen, the local politicians. They've got the money. They've got everything going. They're doing the good works. They've done the baptisms. They'll do the communion. They'll do the confessions. They'll do all these things that you're supposed to do. And they look a lot better than some of us do. And they might even act a little better than some of us do. And you know what? They'll look at that and think, there is no way these people are saved before we're saved. Look at us. But listen, you and I know that it's not about our works, don't we? And the Bible says, you know, if it's of works, it is no more faith. These people that are trying to work their way to heaven are on their way to hell, according to the Bible. And, you know, those of us, I won't say that. I was going to say maybe, you know, sometimes... Sometimes Christians, you know, they look like they're on their way to hell, you know, <laughs> but um, at the same time, you know, and I listen, I'm all for cleaning up your act and cleaning up yourself. But listen, you know, you go get that tattooed infidel out there that the bat, that the Catholic guy was talking about one time, all the tattooed infidels, you know, those people can be saved. And guess what? When you get saved, your tattoos aren't going to disappear. All right. They're still going to be there. Your body's still going to look the same, but if you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are just as saved as anybody else, and you're more saved than that person trying to work their way to heaven that never did get a tattoo. And you know what? That's foolishness to them. You know, you've got the devil tattooed on your arm, and you think you're going to heaven before me? 
Do you not see my halo? Look, that, listen, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what it's all about. And it is. It's, all, it's always going to be seen as foolishness to the world. And, so, you know, and many are ashamed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It will save anyone who will believe, and I'm not ashamed of it. And it's because and it's, it works. And so, you know what? While the world will always scoff at it, while the religious establishments will always scoff at it, and they'll see us as fools for teaching it, I don't care. It works. So, we're going we're gonna to keep on preaching it. It's what we're going to keep on spreading. But, I, but finally, one of the reasons, too, I will always be seen as a fool. And before you think I'm bragging, hear me out. I, am a perfect, I believe I'm a perfect example of what God said he'll use. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Wow, that's a pretty, pretty boastful statement you're making right there. Well, let's see who God said he would use. For you see your calling, brethren, verse 26, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring the, not the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Right there, we see that God uses foolish, weak, base, despised people. That's what God uses. And so, why does, why does God do that? Because God doesn't share his glory with anyone. So God is going to use people that the world will see them being used and they'll say, that's obviously God and not him. Listen, if I, was, if I was the smartest guy, the best looking guy, the most charismatic guy, and the Lord did something great here, everybody would think it was because of me. But if the Lord uses me and something great happens, everybody's going to know it's because of God. So if, I get to, if I'm going to be bragging on anything around here, I'm going to be bragging on the Lord. Okay, but understand, though, the world, though, is always still going to see me as foolish, base, despised, all that stuff. You know, on the bottom of the totem pole. And so you need, you need to understand that. If you all are a part of this church, if you all do what the Bible says, if you're going to be used of God, you will be seen that way. They will see you as those things. You will get accused of those things. You will be told you're just a simpleton. You're a member of a cult. You're whatever. That's, that's what you're going to be told. If you go and you spread this plan of salvation like we spread around here, people are just going to think you're stupid. They're going to think that you're an idiot. But you know what? It's right. And it's what God has chosen. And the primary focus of this church, it's going to continue to be on the spiritual things. I don't have time to talk a whole lot about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 11 through 16. Um, he's, I'll look, look over there real quick. But, uh, well, we're not, we don't have time to read through it, but it talks about how the natural man receiveth not the things of God. Okay? We are going to continue to focus on the spiritual here because the spiritual is what makes the difference. The spiritual is what we're supposed to be about, but churches today, they're all being converted into community fund centers. I've been hearing a lot of people call them Chuck E. Cheese churches. And I like, this, I like that. And it is Chuck E. Cheese churches, man. You know, let's bring in the playgrounds. Let's bring in the arcades. Let's bring... You know, bringing all these, you know, fun, fancy things, the lights, the music, the dancing. Let's do all that stuff. Let's put on a big show for people. You know, if we're going to do that, kind of, everybody's doing the same stupid stuff, the same stupid songs. If we're going to do that, let's do like Chuck E. Cheese and just get those. They have those robots up there that do those songs all the time for the kids and everything. Everybody's doing the same stupid stuff. Why don't we just get robots, mass produce them, put them on the platforms and everybody just come and sit and watch those things. I mean, we might as, we might as well do that. And, and, and that's pretty much what's going on. And then those robots, one-time purchase, we don't have to keep paying them like we do the pastors and stuff. I think it would save a lot of money. And I think it would accomplish just as much as these Chuck E. Cheese churches are accomplishing. But listen, our fo if, if we continue focusing on the spiritual, we will not be the most popular thing in town. Now, if we start working towards, you know, jazzing this place up, you know, 
we might be able to start out doing some of these other places, start getting the money brought in. We might be the funnest church in town. But you know what? What have we accomplished? Nothing. They're going to get bored tomorrow, and they're going to have to keep coming back for entertainment, which they have to keep coming back. We, got to, we can charge them, right? You know, <laughs> but no, that's not what it's about. It's about the spiritual things. And I think it's very clear when we look through the lens of the Scriptures that this church is on the right track. But I'm just going to warn you, if you look at this church through the lens of the world, you are going to see this place as like we're just a bunch of fools. And listen, if you're saved, I believe you're capable of looking through either lens. Sometimes, do we get way too earthly minded, but the world, they are only capable of looking through the lens of the world. They will always see this place as foolish. They will always see this place, you know, see us as some kind of nut, some kind of cult. But you know what? I'm okay with being a fool for Christ's sake. I'm okay with taking some persecution. I'm okay. I'm okay with dealing with some of that. I'm okay with being looked down on in the you know, community of preachers that are out there. That doesn't bother me. Okay. But I do sometimes wonder, you know, I don't want you all to get too freaked out by it. And like Paul said, you know, I tell you this not to shame you, but to warn you because this stuff, there's going to be stuff that's said. You're, you're going to hear some of it. You might get accused of some of these things. And if you're not careful, you'll start listening to them. You'll go back to looking at things through the lens of the world and you will see this church as nuts. It's amazing how many people have been completely content. Everything was fine in their church. And then all of a sudden somebody came along and started, you know, pointing out every little flaw in the church. You're like, yeah, you know what? This church is a terrible place. Well, everything was fine until somebody told you it wasn't. And listen, I believe that's, you know, you're going to hear some of that in the future. If we keep taking the strong stands that we do, if God keeps blessing, the devil's not just going to sit around and let that happen. He's going to, you're going to hear those things. You know, the, the, the internet rumors will go around. Somebody that you work with, hey, I heard this about your church. You know, did you, are you in a cult, whatever? And if you're not careful, you'll start listening to some of that stuff and thinking, man, could, could they be right? Well, listen, they're not right. It's just, but that is how they are going to see it. And I believe all of us ought to be okay with being fools for Christ's sake. And so I, that's what I'm shooting for. I, I, I want, I'm okay with that. I want to be like Paul. And, but if, if you follow my lead, it's going to come on you too. And so I say this to warn you. So with that, let's all stand together.